So hello everyone. I'm Noah, resare from Sweden. Originally I live in London. I'm going to talk about scaling up with DevOps. So I um, understand that there are many different types of organizational sort of um, graphs over time, how you grow versus how you stay still. But, but I have had some experience with companies that have been growing a lot in a short period of time. And I think that that puts focus on some of the uh, patterns in how we work that is very interesting. So I hope that there will be some general purpose learnings. Um, so I'm going to start just mentioning a few things about me, uh, some observations I've done, and then hopefully some practical advice. I have been in tech since 97. I started out as a system administrator, very sort of uh, hands-on configuring email servers and stuff like that. I started to move into government consulting in Sweden, uh, doing work for a lot of different agencies. And it's a kind of a good way to see uh, organizational anti-patterns to, to do consulting in, in public sector. Um, but it was interesting too. In 2007, I entered a startup and I did a startup for three years that no one knows anymore. It kind of went out with a bang or the, the founders being very angry at each other, unfortunately. But um, then I joined F Spotify and Spotify was a small company when I joined. We were about 100 employees in the whole company, about 40 of those were engineers, and I joined the operations team that was, uh, I think, about uh, four or five people, depending on uh, when you start counting. And we were on call for the whole service. Uh, and, and we were growing pretty rapidly at that point, but uh, we had just seen the beginning of that growth. I stayed at Spotify for six and a half years, and the number of engineers in the whole organization scaled with about a factor of 20. So we were more than a thousand engineers when I stopped working there, and, and things changed pretty ra radically. And you can't really keep up with the old patterns of, of working together when you do that kind of jump. Oh, I forgot to start my watch, sorry. Um, and I learned a lot of things. I had an opportunity to work with a lot of specific technologies and also with a lot of sort of company culture type things at Spotify. I uh, spent a lot of time uh, working with our free software efforts and those kinds of things. But I did a different kind of leap uh, three months ago when I uh, moved to London and started working at Facebook. And now I have a much more hands-on technical type of role at Facebook. And it's interesting to see that, that although the technical solutions you come up with at Facebook scale, uh, I had no real numbers, so I looked up the latest public numbers on uh, the amount of employees, full-time employees at Facebook, it's about 15,000. So it's a large, large company. And a lot of the practical solutions you come up with are super different from what you do in a smaller company. But I think that there are some, some sort of general trends in, in how you organize yourself that is really valuable to look at, and it, nevertheless. Facebook has this tendency to, to look into a lot of problems and think, oh, we can fix this in a different way. So they are building, or we are building our own um, top of rack switches because the ones we have aren't programmable, programmable enough. Uh, we are building a lot of specifics with regards to how we set up our data centers and how we uh, provision servers and, and stuff like that. And those things make a lot of sense when you are at the scale of, of hundreds of thousands of computers uh, in data centers. But um, it's kind of uh, at that scale that it makes sense. Um, I think that um, the things that I have identified as DevOps or as like the, the, the values and, and things that, that people talk about at DevOps conferences are things that are very real and very sort of on the top of people's minds at places like both Spotify and Facebook. I would like to uh, give you a little bit of an uh, archetypical um, story about the startup situation uh, to illustrate uh, where you very easily end up. So, what typically happens is that 
you have some founders, they hack together something, they, they come up with a good idea and then they write some code very quickly. They have very, very heavy focus on features and the ones, so there's a bit of selection bias there. You only see the companies actually succeed, but the ones that succeed, they grow a lot and then they need to put in new features and stability and running the service is something that you do like on Friday afternoons and things like that and, and you work too much and, and the focus is always to bring something new to the market. This leads to very fragile software and kind of bad failure modes. And somewhere in between there, you typically hire a set of sysadmins to run this service. And, and they are kind of pulling in the other direction from, from the developers. So developers are tasked with bringing new features, building new things, maybe scaling in the best possible situation. So you build a new solution that scales fabulously uh, to much more, many more users that you have but you haven't really constructed something that thinks a lot about the failure modes, that thinks about what happens when the service is degraded, what happens when network is slow, those kinds of things. Uh, and sysadmins uh, in this fast-moving environment, they tend to, to be very conservative. It's super easy to end up in a situation where you just say no. You just say, ah, that sounds nice, but I don't want to deploy this on my system. You need to, to go back and do something else. And, and essentially, you pull in different directions, uh, the operations team and the sysadmin team, uh, the operations team and the developer team. And that um, can block a lot of progress. And it be, becomes like frustration, and it leads to a bad working environment, I would say. So. Um, I think this is super common, and it's like the, the, the natural thing that happens when you have any type of tech organization. So if you're not careful, and if you're not looking for this, and try to counteract it, that's where you will end up. And how do you identify this? So I would say, um, a question you can ask is, like, is who takes responsibility for what? Is, is it the, only the operations team that is tasked with stability? Is it developers heavily incentivized to prioritize new features? So those are the questions that points out whether this is a sort of a large problem. And to me, that is sort of the problem to which DevOps and the sort of discussions about culture and how we can nudge this in a different direction comes from. So we see this problem and, and it exists in a lot of places. And DevOps and culture and DevOps ideas can help nudge this slightly in a better direction. So I think that uh, what happened at Spotify, and uh, I was very involved in this process, was that we, we essentially ended up in a situation where we couldn't scale the operations team. The systems became too complex, there were too many of them, and we didn't have the capacity to hire those people that could run this service, that had enough previous experience to be able to do that. Um, so we ended up in a situation where we were essentially forced to, to ask a question like, what would it mean if we didn't need an operations team? What would, it, would we need to do to be able to get to a place where we didn't need someone to run the servers that someone else wrote? What, it, like we wanted to end up in a place where developers would own the problem of running their service and, and give them the tools and, and the things that they needed to be able to do that. So what we did was uh, we just realized we needed to write a lot of software, a lot of automation, and write a lot of uh, helper things just like to figure out who's responsible for this. Like when you have a single operations team, it's fine to just have like a note on the wall saying like this person is on call right now. But if you have a hundred different teams that have responsibility for production, you need to have a good system to track down who's the guy, who's the person to, to talk to, those kinds of things. So we ended up starting two new teams. We had uh, SWAT ops, which was essentially old operations were supposed to come in when things really broke and help out and, and be like a resource that we can move around fairly short term. So they would come into a team uh, that had a running system that didn't really work out and, and work for two weeks, three weeks maybe with that, uh, or just be the people that you could when you are on call and everything breaks, like the, the global on call for everything. And then we created another team that called 301. Um, can anyone figure out why, why that is? 
Yeah, it's the moved permanently HTTP uh, response. So, so the idea was that when you were like originally just, I have a problem, let's call ops. And then you would pick up the phone and call ops or figuratively message ops. Like how does that redirect to something else? Uh, and that team was tasked with building uh, solutions to be able to to monitor our systems, to be able to alert in a good way, to be able to solve the problems that we spend a lot of time doing, just simply getting service in people's hands, build uh, provisioning systems, build systems for, for essentially the things that all the companies, all the vendors in the DevOps space are, are, are selling us. And th there are some problems that need solving, and there is a lot of uh, glue that needs to be put between these different solutions and uh, to be able to, to build something where, where uh, developers can do that. And then we did that and mixed it in with essentially handing out uh, on-call rotation to, to a lot of developers and, and moving toward a model where everyone is on-call for their system. And that changes a few things. Like it changes just practically, you get more people, more brains on, on the problem. And, and you get like larger rotations and, and less of the situation when someone is doing on call like every weekend. Uh, but also it changes people's mindsets about things. Like suddenly you prioritize being able to look into whatever happens in the server. Like, yeah, this is slow. What do you do with a server that's slow? Why is it slow? What's happening here? Like bringing the features that give the, the visibility into a piece of software about what it does is very, very valuable. Uh, so that was the, the, the general uh, shift inside Spotify. And it turns out that Facebook has done a very similar shift as well. They, they retired the SRE title. Uh, they moved into something called production engineer, which is much more like a software engineer that works with teams. Uh, so that's my title uh, at Facebook. Works with teams with software development, but has a focus on stability, scalability, reliability of the systems. and. Um, if you want details on that, there is a really good talk from last year's SRECOM that's recorded that you can listen to. Um, our manager's manager's manager, uh, Pedro. <laughs> I haven't met them twice, but um, Pedro Canahati, I think, I think he's Mexican, um, and speaks at length about this change inside a much larger organization, Facebook. So you can see that that both these organizations and a lot of other organizations make really serious infrastructure investments. Um, and, and I think that like, it's been shown that, that these investments pay off. And if I were in a different organization, I would really argue for people making these types of investments. Um, so, next part, advice. I will try to not um, come with too many pieces of advice, but I, I will organize them in three different groups. I think that hiring and onboarding is, uh, like you have proportionally large impact on uh, how people think about problems, how they work together when, you, when it comes to hiring and onboarding. You can change already existing people's minds with a lot of work, and get them to prioritize different things, get them to interact differently, but, but the time where you really can, can change direction is, like who you hire and, and what you do with them when you have hired them, like how do you introduce them to your organization. And my two other advice, I'm just repeating them right now, is optimize for a short feedback cycle, as you said, like optimize for changeability, and also figure out a structured way to learn from your mistakes. So let's start with hiring and onboarding. I think that um, saying that DevOps is about communication is a really good thing. I think that communication, when you have completely different ideas about what you're trying to achieve, is kind of, yeah, you can communicate, but it's more like hurling things at each other than actually communicating. So I think that like alignment of goals might be what I think is DevOps core. Like, if you are going in the same direction, if you are doing a good effort to try to understand the other people and try to understand what the other person wants to do, like humility, like empathy for others and their feelings, 
I think that that's really, really important things. And that's something you can interview for in a little bit. Uh, you want to have the person that can answer I don't know to a question. Ask them questions until they answer I, I don't know. And if they never end up in that place, then you have a problem probably. And don't look at uh, hiring operations people that say, oh, I don't touch code. That's, that's someone else's problem. Uh, don't hire uh, developers that are very, very reluctant to think about or reason about what happens when your code fails, what happens when this breaks, what happens when this, this uh, uh, connection between those two data centers are severely degraded. Those kinds of problems that, that operations people tend to think about. So you don't need to have the full profile and be like a super person that has all of these um, special interests in, all over the place, but, but look at people that are open to thinking about the problems on the other side and, and has the sort of a, a likelihood that they will think of um, uh, things that are truly necessary to be able to bring a stable and, and scalable service. Also, uh, when you have hired them, model behaviors, show people how you do this uh, and talk about. I think that it's important to have a shared story about what, what you're trying to achieve as a company. We're trying to build new features, but we're trying to build this with stability. We're trying to take care of people that makes mistakes. There are famous mistakes inside Facebook shared where, where someone makes a change that, that brings down the service. And, and, and when Facebook is down, it's pretty big news and there are hundreds and hundreds of people working super hard to bring it up again. But, but just like talk about how you wouldn't pin that on that specific person that made a change. And talk about how it's okay to fail. Talk about how um, it's fantastic when you do things that are spectacularly good, but also failing is an opportunity to learn. A failure is an opportunity to collect knowledge. And, and it's interesting, like I had started out with three different pieces of advice, but it feels like it's a lot of overlap there. It's a lot about uh, helping others. It's a lot about working together. One behavior that's modeled at Facebook that is, was surprising to me and very, very interesting is that almost every week, the CEO of the company goes up for an hour of a Q&A. And there are, you have the opportunity to just go up and ask questions. And people ask questions that are really sensitive and that are really uh, sort of about policies, about recent failures, about like um, why do we do this, controversies in media, and, and the, you get the CEO to, to answer questions, say I don't know, say I will follow up on that, but, but really sort of uh, be on the line and, and be um, accountable to the company with regards to coming up with, with a reasonable, thoughtful ex response. And I think that sort of modeling that behavior uh, and model approachability in an organization is super valuable. So all of these illustrations are actual prints that sit around the offices of Facebook. So um, nothing at Facebook is someone else's problem. Uh, move fast. Uh, it, it used to be move fast and break things. Uh, <laughs> turns out that when you have a service that breaks sometimes, it's kind of embarrassing to say, oh, well, that's our policy, we're breaking things. So, so um, then they moved into calling it move fast with stable infra, which is kind of a mouthful and not that catchy. <laughs> but it's a good idea, though. And like, if you have stable infrastructure, you can move fast without uh, breaking the world. And you can recover easily, and, and you can sort of uh, do it in a, in a reasonable way. But move fast is, like, how do you move fast? Yeah, you work many hours, maybe. But, but, um, but more often, I think you work reasonable hours and, and you have a situation where you can get something into production easily without a lot of risk with regards to it going south. And if it goes south, it goes south to a very tiny percentage of the users. So you roll out gradually. Uh, you have lots of monitoring in place to, to measure overall uh, customer experience, those things. Uh, have, have a lot of structured testing. Um, and I think that like optimizing for a, a really quick feedback cycle, if you can know whether an idea is, is good uh, in a week, two weeks, it's so valuable. 
And the way to do that is essentially automate all the things. And it's interesting to see how... <laughs> so for those of you that doesn't read, it says, I find your lack of automation disturbing. Um, and it's interesting to see how many things you can automate. Uh, so one thing that, that you re realize uh, when you work in a large situation is that if you have tens of thousands of servers, some of them is going to be down fairly often. And if, if you have a large system, you will get emails from the site ops, the people that actually push and pull uh, computers and switch disks and stuff like that, to say like, yeah, we're going to offline this rack in 10 days. And then you need to have automation to be able to, to handle that. And if you have certain critical pieces of the infrastructure on those racks, it's like, yeah, we could manage with redundancy just bringing it down, but we want to drain the drain that rack from its data, we want to push it to someplace else, we want to change things around. Those operations are super complex. And that opt automation, um, when it works, it's like a fabulous like Rube Goldberg machine where you have this ball of going through the thing. and like it, It's fascinating. And I think that it's interesting to see that we spend a lot of resources automating things on a high level. And, um, and I think that really pays off. Fail harder, we talked a little bit about that, but, but um, acknowledge that failure is something that needs to happen to be able to make progress. And, and that's just um, something that is um, important to talk about a lot because failure feels terrible. And of most, many times, it's the, the answer if you have this problem that every time you make a new release, it's painful and you fail, and you deliver a, a bad user experience, the, the answer to that problem is most likely do that more. <laughs> if you do releases every two months, and they are always terrible, then the, the right answer might very well be to do release every other week, and do a smaller release, understand more of what you're doing, have a good strategy for, for um, uh, doing monitoring on the rollout, to fall back to the previous version if it failed, those kinds of things. But also, uh, when you fail, make sure that you actually learn from it. Make sure that you have clear, actionable things out of it. Uh, so, um, in DevOps land, we're typically talking about no blame um, follow-ups, or yeah, terminology is, is different in every place. At, at Facebook, we have sev review, which is discussion about failures, uh, about what we did that cause the failure, what we can do in the future to, to make the failure uh, less painful if it happens at the same time, or what we're doing to, to build systems and, and educate people to not do that again. And um, I think that that's, in its simplest form, it can be super easy to just start doing uh, retrospectives or sev review or incident review or whatever you want to call it, and look at what happened have a good understanding of the timeline of events, have a good understanding of why this was so hard to detect, and then come out with actionable things that can be put into backlogs of, of the actual engineers to, to improve and fix things. And that means that you can't really fix the world. You need to have small mouthpiece things that you can actually achieve. It doesn't help anyone to have a list of 20 super large uh, plans or projects to fix some fundamental things. Um, because, yeah, it will never happen. So, look at that, and uh, if you're not doing it, then um, think about whether that's a good idea. So, all of this could be summarized as, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Um, how would you work if failure wasn't so terrible? What would you do if people weren't uh, antagonistic when you came up with an idea. Uh, I think that culture plus system, plus automation, plus technology can really sort of reduce the negative effects of messing up, of introducing change, of being the odd one out, be um, sort of unusual. And I think that's um, DevOps for me, in a way. That's what, what I take out of the things I've learned uh, being on in, in, in DevOps culture for a while. Everyone's hungry, right? Yeah, uh, I think we'll skip the questions and uh, we can 
Or do you, how do people feel? Are you super hungry? Have, Okay, um, inconclusive, uh, but thank you everyone. And um, we can talk afterwards, I'm super happy to talk. I have some th thumbs up stickers if you're interested in. <laughs>